All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight, we're going to read another sutta. So, um, as usual, on Sunday nights, we're getting together to read a sutta. We're going to be reading from the Machima Nikaya, the middle length discourses of the Buddha. And tonight we're going to move over to sutta number 49. So this is going to be the Brahmani Mantika Sutta, the, the invitation by Brahma, the Brahmani Mantika Sutta. Um, yeah, so this will be an interesting sutta for us to talk about. It's sort of one of those uh, suttas that's really focused on just one idea. So it'll give us sort of a very solid thing to think about this evening. Um, yeah, so let's go ahead and get into it. So uh, again, it's sutta number 49. And actually, even before I get into this, a, a little bit of background. So the sutta that we're about to read, it also appears in the Samyutta Nikaya, the Connected Discourses, or I should say that a version of this sutta um, can be found here. And they're basically the same sutta, but they're a little different. So if you're interested in section six of the Majim, or the Samyutta Nikaya, sutta number four, it's the same sutta kind of, and, or at least it's the same theme, the same idea. Um, and just really quickly, um, this particular sutta is going to have a lot of relationship to the first sutta in this collection. So we, we read that sutta a long time ago. It's called the teaching on the root of all things. So there's going to be a little bit of overlap. I know it's been a while since we read that one. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. Um, we're going to do the thing where I just read little bits and then we're going to talk about them. So uh, the Brahmani Mantika Sutta, classic introduction. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One, the Buddha, was living at Savatthi in Jetta's Grove, Anattapintika's park. And there he addressed the monks. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus. Venerable sir, they replied. And the blessed one said this. He told them, bhikkhus, on one occasion, I was living at Ukattaha, in the Subhagha grove, at the root of a royal sala tree. Now, on that occasion, a pernicious view had arisen in Baka, the Brahma. And that pernicious view was this. Baka, the Brahma, the god, he thought... This is permanent. This is everlasting. This is eternal. This is total. This is not subject to passing away. For this is where one is neither born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, nor reappears. And beyond this, there's no other escape. All right, so let's break down who who is Baka and what's what's going on with this. So this is another one of those suttas that I wanted to do because it's kind of one of these more mythological suttas in that sense. And basically what I'm saying is the, the Buddha, by the way, the Buddha's about to go up to heaven and have a conversation with this Brahma who has this pernicious uh, wrong view. 
And I just want us to understand that in 500 BC, around the time when these texts were being written, I want you to be very clear that Buddhism, the Buddha, the Buddhists, they didn't believe in like gods and heavens. Now they do, but what I wanna make clear is, is that what we're reading tonight is a story and they know it's a story. Nobody thinks that like the Buddha disappeared and went up to some other realm and it, it's a way of speaking, it's a way of talking. And if you read enough suttas, you begin to realize that they are very aware that they are telling stories and they're using language that way. So that's the first thing I wanna mention about this is that even though it's gonna be a little supernatural tonight, it's more in the realm of mythology in that sense. Now let's talk about Bakka. So, or actually the, the one thing I did wanna mention is that, so this sutta that we're reading takes place in Savatthi. But in Savatthi, the Buddha's telling everybody about this one time when I was in Ukkattaha in the Subhaga Grove, staying under this royal solitary. And what I want you to know is, is that the very first sutta in this collection is also at this place, Ukattaha, under the royal solitary in the Subhaga Grove. And these are the only two suttas, the one we're reading and number one, these are the only suttas that actually take place at this location. So I just want you to know that this is sort of a, a rare occasion where the Buddha was staying in this one place. And the Buddha knew that this Brahma, this God, had this, had this understanding or had this view. And so we need to talk quickly about a Brahma, like a God. And what I want to remind you of is that, you know, this topic gets raised a lot in the, in conversations about Buddhism. And it's this idea of like, is Buddhism atheistic? Like, you know, does, does Buddhism sort of like deny God or whatever? And it's tricky actually, because on the one hand, there are gods in Buddhism, but as we're going to see tonight, it's the whole point of this sutta. But the reason why Buddhism is sometimes called atheistic, it's because even the gods are suffering. Only a Buddha in that sense is not suffering in that way. And so, as we're going to hear, that puts a Buddha as sort of higher than a god. So that's why people often say that Buddhism is atheistic, because we're not revering, bowing down to, or praying to a deity or a god. So, but who is this Bhakka, this Brahma? Well, within the world of Buddhism, coming you know, out of that Indian milieu, there of course is a bunch of different gods, not just one god. And what I wanna remind you of is that within the world of Buddhism, there's these, it's a way of looking at reality. It's a way of looking at what's going on here. And in the world of Buddhism, as I know all of you know, but just, just in case, in Buddhism, this world can actually be understood as three kind of layers or three dimensions. These are called dahatus, realms. And I want to remind you quickly about the three realms. And the basic idea in Buddhism is that what you see before you most of the time is the realm of desire, the kamadhatu. 
And we want to understand that the realm of desire is the realm of kind of projection, to use a modern psychological phrase, because it's the idea of like projecting value, projecting meaning, projecting um, all kinds of things kind of onto the world. A aesthetics, like the idea of beautiful or ugly, again, useful, all of these ideas. If you look closely, you realize that, well, you take something like beauty and ugliness, and what you realize is that beauty and ugliness are not out there. Beauty, as they say, is in the eye of the beholder. And the way that Buddhism talks about that is that there is one dimension of reality, which is your psychic overlay. That's the realm of desire. Now, in kind of old school, original Buddhism, if you could peel back that layer of desire that you're projecting, if you could peel that back and stop projecting, you would then come to be, you would then come to abide in just the realm of form, the rupa datu. Now, the idea of the realm of form is that this is just the realm of materiality. It's just the realm of objects, kind of size, shape, number, really, really basic building blocks of reality. And the idea is, is that a pile of the earth element or a pile of the water element or a pile of whatever is neither beautiful nor ugly, is not useful nor harmful. It's just kind of very neutral. And indeed, the realm of form is super neutral because it's just, again, it's just shape, size. It's not, there's no meaning. We are projecting the meaning. So that's the realm of form that's kind of underneath the realm of desire. And of course, there's an even deeper realm going on here, which is the formless realm. We're not going to get too into the formless realm tonight. So I'm just going to kind of leave that out there as like the realm of deep meditation. Let's just leave it there as like the, all form. So we don't even have size or shape anymore. So it's just the realm of deep meditation. Let's leave it there for now, the formless realm. Now, when it comes to the realm of desire and the realm of form, there are gods that abide in those realms. And so there is actually a highest god of the realm of desire. And that god is named Indra or Chakra Devanam Indra. And Indra has a whole bunch of gods of desire underneath him. And in that way, Indra is the god of, well, a lot of times Indra is the god of sexuality, the god of the emotions, the god of, you know, things relating to desire, because he's the king or the god of the realm of desire. In the realm of form, there is a highest god named Brahma. And Brahma is called the creator god. And in some circles in India, Brahma's the highest god. Like, is what we would call god, because Brahma created the world. And effectively sustains the world. And so Brahma would be very close to our idea of God in, in a sort of Western Judeo-Christian Islamic sense. Now, Brahma 
the God has like helper, helper gods, lesser gods. And our, our, um, our character here, Baka, is one of those lesser Brahma gods in the realm of form. Now, what we're going to find out is, is of course, that is Baka. Baka is uh, not too sharp in that way. <laughs> but the idea here is, and so what I'm trying to do now is just try to explain this idea, which is that Baka the Brahma has this pernicious view. And his pernicious wrong view is that he is in the realm of form because that's his domain, that's his realm. He's not in the realm of desire because he's a god of the realm of form. And so we are to understand that Baka is beholding the realm of form, his domain, and he is saying, ah, this is permanent. This is everlasting. This is eternal, total not subject to passing away. For this is where one is neither born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away and is reborn. And then he, the, may, the real problem that he has is that Baka also says, and from this, there is no escape. Now, because it's not going to go much further into this, I want to kind of explain something. So uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhikkhu Nyanamoli, the two translators, as usual, they have great footnotes to the sutta. And one of their footnotes is about how we could and perhaps should be thinking about this Baka the Brahma, not as like a god exactly but we should be thinking about it that that being as representing a mind that has achieved the state of being in the realm of pure form and that that mind that reaches that state may develop the idea that this is it this is permanent this is eternal this is total. And so to put it another way, what we want to kind of notice or what we want to be thinking about is how no matter whether we're talking about religion, philosophy, science, uh, the law, I mean, like, you know, like legality and stuff, no matter what we're talking about in those realms, again, religion, science, philosophy, jurisprudence, right? All of those are disciplines, if you will, that are searching for the bedrock solid bottom upon which all the rest of reality can rest. And what I'm getting at is, really quickly, in a traditional Indian context, not Buddhist, but just a traditional Indian context, they're very aware that this particular body is changing and is impermanent. They're very aware that the physical world, in a way, is always changing and is, in a sense, impermanent. And so what there is, is in, in general, there's a search for what is permanent. Like, what can I rest on that is solid, eternal, and permanent? And of course, in the traditional kind of Indian religious context, the idea that you have of your like your name and even the way you look now, all of this is temporary. But in a traditional Indian context, 
at the core, there is what is called the Atman, or in Pali, the Atta. And this Atman, which is sometimes translated as a soul or the true self, the Atman is considered that which is the eternal, permanent, unchanging aspect of the self that is basically the divine aspect. And so what we're dealing with here is the mentality, whether it's Bhakka the Brahma or a meditator or whoever, we're dealing with the mentality that thinks it has reached the truth, the bedrock, the bedrock solid thing. And then the idea is, I made it. <laughs> I have reached the eternal in that way. So that's kind of more or less Baka's uh, pernicious view that, you know, and if you've been studying Buddhism, of course, you know that that pernicious view he has is that he believes that there is something eternal, everlasting, and permanent. Yeah, no. Um. So the pernicious view is that he believes there's something eternal, anything eternal and and permanent, or that he thinks that the having uh, I guess escaped the realm of desire and arrived at the realm of form, that 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 is sort of as far as he can go, which which those are kind of two different things. Yeah, so, and that's where again, if you read the footnotes, the sutta is not exactly super clear about what Bakka's talking about when he says, this is eternal. <laughs> What's eternal? <laughs> and that's where you can fill in the blanks. And it's sort of like, well, we know that Brahma, like Brahma's, Brahma gods abide in this realm of pure form. And there is a tradition, not Buddhist, but there is a tradition that if you can kind of like get to the realm of pure form, you're in the eternal domain of God mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. Now, it's also that Baka, Baka the Brahma, he might also be just saying, I'm eternal. I'm permanent. Let's read further, though, because it will unfold. Yeah. Okay. So, the Buddha now tells the gang, I knew with my mind the thoughts in the mind of Baka the Brahma. So, just as quickly as a strong man might extend, extend his flexed arm or flex his arm, his bent arm, extended arm, the Buddha says, I vanished from the root of the royal sala tree in the Subhaga grove at Ukataha and appeared in the Brahma world. Baka the Brahma saw me coming in the distance and said, Come, good sir. Welcome, good sir. It is long, good sir, since you found an opportunity to come here. Now, good sir. This is permanent. <laughs> this is everlasting. This is eternal. This is total. This is not subject to passing away. For this is where one is neither born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, nor reappears. And here, this is beyond, and beyond this, there's no other escape. When this was said, I told Baka the Brahma, the worthy Braka, Baka the Brahma has lapsed into ignorance. He's lapsed into ignorance in that he says of what is impermanent, that it's permanent. He says of the transient, that it's everlasting. He says of the non-eternal, that it's eternal, of the incomplete, that it's total. He says of what is subject to pass away, 
that is not subject to pass away of where one is born, ages, dies, passes away, and reappears, he says that here, one is neither born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, nor reappears. And Bakka says this, that when there is another escape beyond this, he says there's no other escape beyond this. And by the way, of course, the escape that is beyond this is nirvana, liberation, what we're here to talk about, right? Okay, so that's the, the little brief conversation with the, with the Brahma, with Bhakka. But then something new. Oh, actually, before we do that, before we move on to this next section, I want to remind you that what was spoken about here by the Buddha, where he says, oh, Bhakka, he has mistaken that which is impermanent for being permanent. And he's mistaken that which is not eternal for being eternal. I want to remind you that that idea of mistaking what is impermanent to be permanent, for example, that's what's called viparaya in the in Sanskrit, vipalasa in Pali. And it is almost always translated as inverted thinking. In the, in the Heart Sutra, if you're familiar with the Heart Sutra, it's some, sometimes translated as upside down thinking. But the basic idea is, is that it's totally mistaken, deluded thinking. And in this sutta, it's about mistaking that which is actually impermanent, but like Bakka, somebody thinks it's permanent. Now, normally, viparaya, this idea of inversion, it's usually about mistaking that which is impermanent and thinking it's permanent, thinking that that which is causing you suffering, the inversion is thinking that it's pleasure. <laughs> There's another inversion, which is thinking that which is defiled, thinking that it's pure. And then the last one is, thinking that there's a self when there is no self. So those are the classic traditional four inverted views. Here, we are only dealing with the first one, the idea of permanence versus anicca, impermanence. Okay, so that's Bhaka's problem, the Buddha says. But now we have a new character, Mara, the evil one. <laughs> so now in this story, it says that then Mara, the evil one, took possession of a member of Brahma's assembly. And then that member who was under the possession of Mara, the evil one, that member of the assembly says to the Buddha, Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu. So he calls him a monk. Bhikkhu, Bhikkhu, do not disparage Bhakka the Brahma. Do not disparage him. For this Brahma is the great Brahma, like the Brahma, the overlord, the untranscended, the one of infallible vision wielder of mastery, Lord, maker, and creator, most high, master and father of those that are, that the, of those that are and will ever be. Now, this person possessed by Mara goes on to say, way before your time, Bhikkhu, there were recluses and Brahmins, you know, meditators in the world who condemned the earth element and were disgusted with earth, who condemned water and were disgusted with the water element, who condemned fire and were disgusted with fire, 
who condemned air and were disgusted with air, who condemned beings and were disgusted with beings, who condemned gods and were disgusted with gods, who, con who condemned Pajapati and were disgusted with Pajapati, who condemned Brahma and were disgusted with Brahma. And these meditators that did all of that, on the dissolution of the body when their life was cut off, they became established or reborn in an inferior body. Before your time, Bhikkhu, there were also recluses and Brahmins in the world who lauded and delighted in the earth element, who lauded water and delighted in water, who lauded fire and delighted in fire, who lauded air and delighted in air, who lauded beings and delighted in beings, who lauded gods and delighted in gods, who lauded Pajapati and delighted in Pajapati, who lauded Brahma and delighted in Brahma. And on the dissolution of the body, when their life was cut off, they became established in superior bodies. So Bhikkhu, I tell you this, be sure, good sir, to do only as Brahma says. Never overstep the words of Brahma. If you overstep the word of Brahma, Bhikkhu, then like a man using a stick to chase away the goddess of luck when she approaches, or like a man missing the earth with his hands and feet as he slips into a deep chasm, so, it, so too will it befall you. Bhikkhu, be sure, good sir, to do only as Brahma says. Never overstep the words of Brahma. Do you not see the Brahma's assembly seated here, Bhikkhu? And Mara the evil one thus called, thus called to witness the Brahma assembly. Now, before we kind of get to the Buddha's reply, so really quickly, Mara, right? Let's remember, you know, that Mara, that actual word, means death. And so in that way, this being, Mara, that we are always hearing about, also called Papian, the evil one, I want us to understand that in the world of Buddhism, Mara is a, a personification or in mo many instances, a zoomorphication of the idea of death. Like the specter of dying, the specter of death that kind of looms over all of us in a way, goading us into various actions, goading us into various worries. Yeah, that's Mara, the evil one. And Mara has possessed somebody in the audience and has basically told the Buddha, but calling him just a regular monk, and has basically used this very interesting language, language like the Most High, language of the Master and Father of all beings, uh, Overlord, uh, the maker and creator, all of these titles of Brahma would be very, very natural in the Quran or in the Bible or in the, you know, the Old Testament in that way. These are terms that are always used to talk about God. And what I want you to kind of recognize is that what Mara is saying is he's saying to the Buddha, he's saying, you're talking to God, buddy. You better bow down and just do as he says. Before we go any further with this sutta, I really would like to pause at exactly how radical this is. <laughs> it's so radical that Buddhism is sort of, it's not making fun of theistic religion in that way. It's not making fun of it, but it's definitely kind of putting it down in that sense. 
But let's get to why in that way. Yeah, Noam, please. Sorry, I appear to have a lot to say today. Yeah, no, great. <laughs> um, it seems like Mara is trying to scare the Buddha. Like, oh, you know, you you better or scare us. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you better listen to to Brahma, because otherwise you're gonna be toast. Like if you listen to Brahma, if you do what Brahma says, all these good things will happen to you, you know, then you don't have to fear death in a way. Mm. Now, Noam, what's what's really kind of going on, and it's going to kind of come out in the sutta, but I'll tell you now because it it's related to what your 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 comment. What it is, is that because Baka, the the Brahma, because he has this pernicious inverted view about permanence, he's under the control of Mara. And so the Buddha has come to try to get Baka out of his ignorance. And so Mara has showed up and it's not about the Buddha. It's about keeping hold of Baka. Baka. Or, or of us. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because again, there is overlap in we are Baka if we believe in permanence. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is definitely about Mara wanting to keep a hold of, of a God in that way. Um, so Mara in disguise refers to Baka not only as a little Brahma, which he is, but Mara elevates him all the way to the to the big Brahma, the Maha Brahma, and then evokes all of this language of divinity. And then basically says that long before you were born, <laughs> monk, there were meditators who basically were disgusted with creation. And then when they were reborn, they were reborn in an inferior body, in a hell realm, hungry ghost. But the point is, is that because they disparaged creation, they were reborn in a lesser body. But those meditators, Brahmins and recluses, that delighted in the physical world, that delighted in creation, they received superior bodies after death. So that's where Mara in disguise is telling the bhikkhu, meaning the Buddha, you should revere this guy. You should revere Brahma. And then you'll be reborn in a better body. But of course, when this was said, the, the Buddha is talking now. When this was said, I told Mara, the evil one, I know you, evil one. Do not think he doesn't know me. You're Mara, the evil one, and the Brahma and the Brahma's assembly and the members of the Brahma's assembly have all fallen into your hands. They've all fallen into your power. You, evil one, you think, this one too has fallen into my hands. He too has fallen into my power. Ah, but I've not fallen into your hands, evil one. I've not fallen into your power. When this was said, Baka the Brahma told me, told the Buddha, Good sir, I say of the permanent that it's permanent, of the everlasting that it's everlasting, of the eternal, I say that it's eternal, of what is total, I say that it's total, of what is not subject to passing away, that is not subject to passing away, I say of what one is neither born nor ages nor dies nor passes away nor reappears, that here one is neither born nor ages nor dies nor passes away nor reappears. And when there is no escape beyond this, I say there's no, no escape beyond this. Before your time, Bhikkhu, there were recluses and Brahmins in the world 
whose asceticism lasted as long as your whole life. They knew when there is another escape beyond, that there is another escape beyond. And they knew that when there is no other escape beyond, that there is no other escape beyond. So Bhikkhu, I tell you this, you will find no other escape beyond. And eventually you will reap only weariness and disappointment. If you will hold to the earth, you will be close to me, within my domain, for me to work my will upon you and punish you if, if need be. If you hold to water, to fire, to air, to beings, to gods, to Pajapati, to Brahma, then you will be close to me, within my domain, for me to work my will upon and to punish. All right, so just to just to clarify, in the beginning, when I said I was kind of filling in the blanks and I was saying that it seems like Baka is saying that the realm of form is what is eternal, is what is everlasting, is what is permanent. Well, that kind of has come back around with this idea where Baka now, not, not Mara, but Baka is saying, no, 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 no. What I'm calling permanent is permanent. What I'm calling no escape, there's no escape. And then he says this thing at the end that he's basically, so if you, if you love the elements, if you love earth, fire, water, air, beings, gods, and Brahma, then you'll be close to me. You'll be in my domain. And I can work my influence on you in that way. And the Buddha says, I know that too, Brahma. If I will hold to earth, I shall be close to you within your domain for you to work your will upon and to punish. If I hold to water, to fire, to air, to beings, to gods, to Pajapati, to Brahma. I shall be close to you, within your domain, for you to work your will upon and punish. That's right. <laughs> Further, the Buddha says, I understand your reach and your sway to extend thus. Baka the Brahma has this much power, this much might, and this much influence. Now, good sir, this is, this is now Baka replying to the Buddha saying, Now, good sir, how far do you understand my reach? How far do you understand my sway to extend? And the Buddha replies in verse, saying, As far as the moon and sun revolve, shining and lighting up the four directions or the quarters, over a thousandfold such worlds does your sovereignty extend. And there you know high and low, and those with lust, and you know those who are free from lust, the state that is thus and otherwise, you know the coming and going of all beings. Brahma, I understand your reach and your sway to extend thus. Baka the Brahma has this much power, has this much might, has this much influence. But Brahma, there are these three bodies, which you neither know of nor see, but I do know of and I do see. There is the body called the gods of streaming radiance, from which you have passed away and reappeared here as Baka. 
because you have dwelt here for so long, your memory of that has lapsed. And hence, you do not know it and you do not see it. But I know it. I see it. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I know more than you. Okay. <laughs> so that's what I'm getting at in terms of this radical, radical theology. This is radical theology for a human that has achieved full potential to then go to God and say, I know things you don't even know. And that's where we get a kind of a very, what was articulated here is a very classic Buddhist understanding. And what it is, is it's that the gods, their lives are so long that they forget that they had a life before that. And so because they are, their lifespan is so long and they forget their previous life, they start to assume that where they're at is all there is, is eternal and forever in that way. Now, the idea here is, is that in traditional Buddhist cosmology, there are these kind of higher realms that are even above the realm of Brahma, the realm of streaming radiance. Um, there's others as well. And so the idea here is, again, that is that this being that is Baka the Brahma used to be an even higher god, but then fell down into being Baka the Brahma, had a lapse of memory, and started to presume that things were permanent. And again, by the way, this is kind of like the mythology about us, that we also forget after a while, and we too develop pernicious views of permanence in a certain way. So, all right. So this is, that was the, the first way in which the Buddha demonstrated that he actually knows more than Brahma, not just on the same level as Brahma. Ah, and this is the, the other of those two bodies, or there were three bodies. The first is streaming radiance. Then the Buddha says, there is the body, a realm, called the gods of refulgent glory. And one more, there is the body called the gods of great fruit. You do not know or see that but I know and see it. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I know more than you. Brahma, having directly known the earth element as the earth element, and having directly known that which is not partaken of the earthness of the earth, I do not claim it to be earth. I do not claim it to be in the earth. I do not claim it to be apart from earth. I do not claim earth to be mine. I do not affirm earth. Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I know more than you. So in case you missed it, because it's kind of buried in weird language there, in paragraph 11, where he says to, to Baka, I have directly known earth as earth. And having directly known it that way, he says, I don't claim of myself, this is the part that's kind of missing, but he says, having known earth directly, I don't claim that I am earth, meaning that I'm that 
I am made of earth. This hand might be made of earth and water. This elbow might be made of earth and water. But me, I, not earth and water. So I do not claim to be part of, I do not claim to be earth. I don't claim to be in the earth. I don't claim to be apart from earth. I don't claim earth to be mine. I don't affirm earth. And that's the way in which the Buddha says, I know not just equal amounts of you, but I know more than you. So what we're getting around to, and I, I know this is get, the sutra is getting a little clunky, but what we're getting around to, of course, is this essential teaching of Buddhism. And it's the essential teaching that avoids the two extremes. So let's see. Yeah, just because I don't, I don't want to lose the thread altogether. So I want to make this really clear as far as like, why, why does the Buddha have a problem with Baka thinking things are permanent? Like, so what? Let him think things are permanent, right? Well, I want to kind of articulate what's going on here. So it often happens that folks, people will start studying Buddhism and they'll learn about this teaching of impermanence. This teaching that says, if you, if you look carefully, you'll notice that everything is kind of changing, decaying, and ultimately coming to nothing. Everything. They look around. And when people hear that, about the kind of teachings of Buddhism, it often occurs to people, isn't this called nihilism? Isn't this idea that everything just eventually comes to nothing and therefore there's no point to anything? If everything is eventually going to go out of existence anyways, all we're doing is speeding that up or slowing it down. But the idea is, is that the fate of all things is eventually nihility. So why isn't Buddhism a form of nihilism? It would seem like it would be right. So those are the two extreme views. One extreme view is nihility, is nihilism. And the other extreme view is what is called eternalism, what Baka the Brahma believes. Now, it's not about believing that this is eternal, or that this is eternal, or that that's... It's not about believing everything's eternal. It's about thinking that there's something eternal. Something unchanging, something solid, something like God in that way. So those are the two extreme views, nihilism or eternalism. And Baka the Brahma has fallen into the pernicious view of permanence, of eternalism. And the thing that I want to explain using this section where the Buddha is saying that I don't claim to be earth, I don't claim to be in the earth, What's being articulated there is actually how it is that Buddhism is neither nihilistic nor a form of eternalism. This is what is called the middle path. And the idea here is it's about you. And what I mean by that is there's one idea which is that I exist 
but only for a limited amount of time. And then there's an idea that when I go out of existence, meaning when I die, that that's it. And that would be the nihilistic point of view. Now, there's another idea out there in the world, which is that this will go on for a while, but when I die, I will go up to heaven and be with God forever. Like my soul will be released and I'll go be with God forever. Or maybe I meditated a lot and my Atman will be freed and unite with Brahma forever. But what I'm getting at is, is that there's, it's about this idea of me and what happens to me when I die. Is it nihilism or is it eternalism? And the way that Buddhism or the way that the Buddha explains this middle path, it's about understanding that what both of those ideas are predicated upon, which is this idea of the self and the question of does the self exist after death or does the self go on forever? Thinking that way presumes the existence of a self already. And now the idea is, is like, what's going to happen to me? And the point is, is that at least in, ter in terms of Buddhism, nobody thought to ask any questions about that me. It's so obvious, right? Right? Me. It's so obvious. Unless you start thinking about it a little bit. And then you begin to realize that you have no idea what you think you are. <laughs> I, again, we kind of look in the mirror and we're like, yeah, that's me. But if you start really breaking it down and it's like, yeah, I guess I'm not really the pinky. All of a sudden it's like, well, what are you? And you could go searching for the true self or you could have the enlightenment experience that the Buddha had, which is realizing, oh, there isn't a self that exists in time. And therefore, there's nothing that would go out of existence and there's nothing that would stay in existence forever. And that's how this subtle teaching, this very subtle teaching of no self dismantles the whole paradigm of nihilism versus eternalism. It pulls the little rug right out from underneath it in that way. So that's what the Buddha is about to explain a little bit more for Baka. But I kind of wanted to give you that, like, give it to you ahead of time. So everybody good with that? Cool. Okay. So now... All right. So the Buddha has asserted, I'm not in the earth. Earth is not mine. All of that. And that's another way that the Buddha knows more than the Brahma. And then the Buddha says, Brahma, Baka, having directly known water is water, fire is fire, air as air, beings as beings, Gods as gods, Pajapati as Pajapati, Brahma as Brahma, the gods of streaming radiance as the gods of streaming radiance, having known the gods of refulgent glory as the gods of refulgent glory, having known the gods of great fruit as the gods of great fruit, having known Maheshvara, the overlord, as Maheshvara, the overlord, having known all as all and having directly known that which is not partaken of the allness of all i do not claim to be all 
I do not claim to be in all. I do not claim to be apart from all. I do not claim to be, I do not claim all to be mine. I do not affirm all. <laughs> Thus, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I know more than you. So, the one paragraph went into detail about the earth element, and then we kind of just moved very quickly through water, fire, wind, all the different gods and all of that. But it's the same idea. And in the original sutta, I want to remind you that in the original sutta, it would have repeated the entire thing for the water element, and then the entire thing for the fire element, and so on. So, all right. So, oh, by the way, the one thing where the Buddha said, I do not claim to be in earth. I do not claim to be earth. I do not claim to be apart from earth. You might recall that that was one of them. And then in this one, when he got to the idea of the everything or the all, and he said, yeah, I am not in the totality of all things, but I'm not apart from the totality of all things either. And I just want to make it clear that what he's saying there is that when I, meaning the Buddha, when I say that I'm not the earth element, I'm not saying that I'm like somewhere else. I'm not saying that I'm not the earth element. Does that make sense to everybody? Like that idea that, because basically there's no self. <laughs> so it can't be apart from the, because that would kind of turn it into something that exists by itself over there. So the Buddha is saying, yeah, I'm not this, but I'm not somewhere else either. Yeah, Lane. Oh, do I need to? Um, is this like the whole subject object thing where like when we if we presume a self we see it as sep like I'm here and that's there and this is a subject object relationship but actually it's not yep. is that what we're talking about yep that is exactly very well said by the way Lane wonderful in terms of that recognition that in in terms of dependent origination in that way Understanding that, yes, when there is, when there's the idea of not me, there's immediately the me. Or when there's the idea of me, there's immediately the idea of not me. And then that creates this sort of, uh, uh, you know, it's like the two sides of the same coin idea in that way. And so... Indeed, the Buddha is talking about not being other than any of that in that way. Like recognizing what the self actually is. It's what, by the way, it's what he means or what I think he means by this language of having known earth as earth, having known beings as beings. Lane, in terms of what we just said, the idea is, is that the Buddha knows the self as the self, meaning as the other side of the subject-object relationship. Now, it doesn't mean that it exists, but we understand fully what it is. Cool. Cool. All right. So, having said all that, especially the part about the Buddha saying, I'm not in everything. I'm not everything, right? Baka 
says to the Buddha, well, good sir, if that is not partaken of by the allness of all, may it not turn out to be vacuous and empty for you? A complicated little sentence, but basically what he's saying is, is that, hey, Buddha, if you're saying that you are not part of the all of everything, then aren't you just sort of talking? M meaning, like, isn't that then just a vacuous idea? Like, the me that isn't a me or whatever. Like, he's kind of pointing at the idea of like, that doesn't sound like anything. And then the Buddha recites a little tiny verse. Consciousness non-manifesting, boundless, luminous all around. That is not partaken of by the earthness of earth. That is not partaken of by the wateriness of water. That is not partaken of by the allness of all. Now, if you read Bhikkhu Bodhi's footnote number 513 to that really cryptic little verse passage of consciousness non-manifesting, boundless, luminous all around, <laughs> if you read his footnote, he basically says that this is one of the hardest verses in Buddhism to translate. I've come across this same verse other places. It's very tricky, but the 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 clue is the language of luminous luminousness all around. It's kind of pointing to this kind of bright, luminous mind that isn't a thing, but understands things in that way. And so that mind is not part of the earthiness of earth in that way, or the wateriness of water. Okay. And now, having had this interesting little exchange with the Buddha, Baka the Brahma basically says, I'm out of here. <laughs> and he says, Good sir, I shall vanish from you. And the Buddha says, yeah, vanish from me if you can. Then Baka the Brahma saying, I shall vanish from the recluse Gotama. I shall vanish from the recluse Gotama. But Baka was unable to vanish. Thereupon I said, Brahma, I shall vanish from you. Vanish from me if you can, good sir. And then the Buddha says, Then I performed such a feat of supernormal power that the Brahma and the Brahma's assembly and the members of the Brahma's assembly could hear my voice, but they couldn't see me. After I had vanished, I uttered this verse. Having seen fear in being and having seen that being will cease to be, I do not welcome any kind of being, nor do I cling to delight. At that, the Brahma and the Brahma's assembly and the members of the Brahma's assembly were struck with wonder and amazement, saying, It is wonderful, sirs. It's marvelous. The great power and the great might of the recluse Gotama. We've never before seen or heard of any other recluse or Brahmin who had such great power and such great might as, as has this recluse Gotama who went forth from the Sakyan clan. Sirs, though living in a generation that delights in being, that takes delight in being, that rejoices in being, the Buddha has extirpated being together with its root. 
Then Mara, the evil one, took possession of another member of Brahma's assembly. And he said, so the person in possession says to the Buddha, good sir, if that is what you know, if that's what you've discovered, do not guide your lay disciples or those who have gone forth. Don't teach your dharma to your lay disciples or to the monks who have gone forth. Have no yearning for lay disciples or for those who have gone forth. Before your time, Bhikkhu, there were recluses and Brahmins in the world claiming to be accomplished and fully enlightened, and they guided their lay disciples and their monks. They taught the dharma to their lay disciples and to those who had gone forth. They had a yearning for lay disciples and for those who had gone forth. And upon the dissolution of the body, when their life was cut off, they became established in an inferior body. Before your time, Bhikkhu, there were also recluses and Brahmins in the world claiming to be accomplished and fully enlightened, but they did not guide their lay disciples. They did not guide those who had gone forth. They did not teach the Dharma to their lay disciples or those who had gone forth, and they had no yearning for lay disciples and those who had gone forth. And on the dissolution of the body, when their life was cut off, they became established in a superior body. So Bhikkhu, I tell you this, be sure, good sir, to abide inactive, devoted to a pleasant abiding here and now. This is better left undeclared. And so, good sir, don't advise anybody else. When this was said, I told Mara the evil one, I know you, evil one. Don't think that he doesn't know me. You're Mara, the evil one. It's not out of compassion for their, for their welfare that you speak this way. It's without compassion for their welfare that you speak this way. You think thus, evil one. Those to whom the recluse Gotama teaches the Dharma will escape from my sphere. Those recluses and Brahmins of yours, evil one, who claimed to be fully enlightened, they were not fully enlightened. But I, who claim to be fully enlightened, I'm fully enlightened. If the Tathagata teaches the Dharma to disciples, he is such, evil one. And if the Tathagata does not teach the Dharma to disciples, he is such. If the Tathagata gu guides disciples, he is such, evil one. And if the Tathagata does not guide disciples, he is such. Why is that? Because the Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile, that bring renewal of being, that give trouble, that ripen into suffering, and that lead to future birth, aging, and death. He's cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Just as a palm tree whose crown is cut off is incapable of further growth, so too the Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defilement, that defile them off at the root. He's made them like a tree, a palm stump, done away with them, so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Thus, because Mara was unable to reply, and because it began with the Brahma's invitation, this discourse is called On the Invitation of Brahma. So that last part right there, where the where the Buddha is telling Mara or the possessed being this idea that 
the Tathagata has abandoned the taints that defile. And then this language of that he's cut them off at the root. Basically, as I understand it, that's what I was kind of getting at when I was talking about the teaching of no self. It, it removes that which nihilism and eternalism are predicated upon. And so because you remove the, that root, there's just no more place for views. So I wanted to kind of like, you know, take the Buddhist language and smash it together with my language there. Um, but we did complete the sutra. Anything pop up? Any ideas, questions, comments? Yay. Noe? Oh, I, all kinds of stuff, but it's just, it's just me grabbing onto things. <laughs> they really, <laughs> you know, it, it's funny how the mind would, my mind will grasp the mind as self. There, the mind is self. And so my mind is that, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about, uh, what about uh, Aditama? What about Pure Land? What about all these futuristic dialogues we have later? Mm teachings you know oh, there's a buddha uh, uh who will if you you know think about that buddha you will then be born into his realm where enlightenment what is this you know again it, it's funny it's a like take a deep breath uh yeah i'm just spinning around a little bit mm -hmm. and overwhelmed uh, not overwhelmed but just kind of like, okay be patient there more will be revealed <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> i want to know but that's it i want to know never mind disregard <laughs> you can eliminate this from the chat <laughs> <laughs> but no way i do i do want to uh respond to something that you said and it's because it's a really important idea so I know that the way that this goes is, you know, I, th I throw out there, I, I throw out there this question of, are you your hand, right? And we kind of realize that if we lost our hand through some unfortunate accident, we realize that we, we would not disappear. And that reveals to us, oh, I'm not the hand. I assume that goes for the other hand, the arms, the legs, the torso. And so that kind of eliminates the physical body as being me. And then if you know, you're very smart. So we immediately then say, oh, so it's this mind that is thinking about the hand that is not me. The mind that is thinking that, that must be me, right? Now, the thing that I want to remind you of is that within the teachings of Buddhism, there is this teaching about the five aggregates, the five skandhas, and those are the physical body, number one, form, sensations, perception, our habits, or our conditioning. And the fifth one is consciousness. And the idea is that in the exact same way that there can be clinging to the body as self, there can be clinging to sensations as me, perception, like I'm perceiving this, or my habits, my conditioning, or my thinking, my mind. And what I kind of want to remind us all of, and I've, we've, we've talked about this many times, but I want to really like, just really nail it down. We want to be aware of what I call, this is my language for a Buddhist idea, but we want to be aware of what I call singularizing. Meaning, Look, we do it all the time. 
it's the idea of taking that which is obviously multiple, clearly obviously multiple. There's the lead, the eraser, the plastic, but notice that the mind can just hold it as one object. It's not one object, but it can hold it as one object. Well, form, sensation, perception, conditioning, and consciousness. And the mind wants to hold those five distinct things as, and that's called me, self, I, and mine. So it's a habit of, it's a, uh, a conditioning, a samskara of mind to singularize. And it keeps doing it, even then to the creation of a self. And so it truly is a, a loosening of that grip on the singularity. So that was my best attempt, Noe, at, at... <laughs> Awesome. Robin, great to see you. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, when Baca was describing um, where he was, his pernicious view, it sounded so similar to how Tathagata can be described, like, you know, unchanging, uncreated, um, you know, not so. So I'm just wondering about how uh, he, he's like, he's sort of so close. Mm -hmm. Somehow he's, he, you know, of course it's because of the self, but I mean that those are descriptions of Tathagata. Yep. Really good. Uh, good looking out there, Robin. In fact, I, I didn't go down this little road, but it's, it's, I should have in a way. So part of that pernicious view of Baka, in addition to permanence, eternalism and all of that, he has this one idea. Uh, dig it, dig it. It's about, oh, sorry. Let me go back to the first articulation of it. That for, for this, meaning the realm of form, the realm of Brahma, his, his eternal realm, he says, for this is where one is neither born, nor ages, nor dies, nor passes away, nor reappears. Yes, you, you, it's sort of like, yeah, doesn't that sound like Buddhahood? But you are totally right, Robin. It's not, though, because it is the idea of me, the self, no more rebirth, no more, you know, it's the idea of like, I'm locked in and permanent. And that's why there's no rebirth and all of that. But in the Tathagata, in Buddha, there's no rebirth because the delusion of that which was going to be reborn is gone. So, but very good, Robin, to notice that there were like overlap in language, but not exactly though. So, cool. All right. Any other last questions, comments, answers, ideas? Maria. Um, I would love for you to just say a couple words, especially in light of that last comment about consciousness non-manifesting. Ah, ah, uh, I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned that too. So the Buddha's cryptic little verse: consciousness non-manifesting, boundless luminousness all around excellent so i said it a moment ago there's form sensation perception conditioning and consciousness and just like mind clings to body as self it can cling to consciousness as self but there's something really important about vijnana or vijnana that the, what is being translated as consciousness in Buddhism, that word vi, 
Vijnana, it, it's always talking about subject-object consciousness. And we know that that's problematic because of like the empty nature of things. We know that that's problematic for a variety of reasons, right? Meaning consciousness is problematic because it's delusional. And so we don't actually within the world of like Buddhism in that way, we actually don't want to be relying on and using consciousness. In other words, consciousness, we want to be non-manifesting. We do not want consciousness arising because consciousness would be about a me conscious of that versus the boundless luminous mind that for simplicity's sake, we can basically say is non-dual. And therefore there can't be consciousness. This is very Sharangama Sutra too, Maria. I want to remind you of that. Little M mind, big M mind. The little M mind is about me thinking about that thing and that thing and that thing. The big M mind is the non-dual mind that understands it is the totality of all things in that way. But like the Buddha said, but not thinking I am the totality of all things. Because that would then cr crimp. I like to use the language of crimping. It would like crimp off a little self where there's not a self, but that's what the self is, is a little crimp. Well, crimp in the mind in that way. Yeah. Oh, good. Yay, yay, yay. I got to the last like 20 minutes of Dharma doors is always the best, I have to say. <laughs> Yeah, like? I say that to people. I'm like, you're going to sit there for an hour and 10 minutes and be like, I don't know what's going on. But the last 20 minutes, it comes home. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right, everybody. And that's going to conclude another sutta, another Dharma doors. <laughs>